All right, so welcome to uh, the first in the series of uh, World Braille Day events called Looking Through the Crystal Ball, Innovations in Braille Technology for the 21st Century and Beyond. So before we start, as with all online conferences, please follow good etiquette by keeping yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Um, so for iPhone users, that's the bottom left corner, Alt A on PC, Option A on Mac. Use the raise hand option when you have a question. Um, so double tap your name in the participants list on an iPhone or go into the more tab and find the raise hand there. Alt Y on a PC or Option Y on a Mac. And save the use of the chat feature for urgent questions and comments. Uh, once again, the information part of this session will be recorded and later posted on the Braille Literacy Canada YouTube channel. And we will stop the recording prior to the question and answer portion. So my name is Rianne LaPere. I am the Braille and Accessibility Testing Coordinator at the National Network for Equitable Library Service. Um, I'll introduce our wonderful panelists shortly. Um, but the World Braille Day planning organizations acknowledge the historic oppression of land, cultures, and original peoples in what we know now as Canada. We respect and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land and will continue to honor the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty we have made into Indigenous nations and peoples. Please take a moment to acknowledge the lands on which you live, work, and play. Braille Literacy Canada, the Canadian Council of the Blind, the CNIB Foundation, the Centre for Equitable, Equitable Library Access, the National Network for Equitable Library Service, and the Provincial Resource Centre for the Visually Impaired had a lot of fun working together and are pleased to deliver this session of events during the month of January in celebration of World Braille Day. Access to communication in the widest sense is access to knowledge. We must be treated as equals and communication is the way we can bring this about. Braille is knowledge and knowledge is power. And that's a quote by Louis Braille. So I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. We have Debbie Gillespie and she is a consultant in digital, digital accessibility and wayfinding. Yep, bring on those Braille signs. And currently a member of the Toronto Advisory Committee on Accessible Transit. So one fun thing about Debbie is that anything chocolate is always good. And we also have Jen Golden and she has a master's degree in linguistics and is an accessibility compliance specialist with Crawford Technologies. She loves Starbucks, orange chocolate and British literature, not always in that order. We, we also have Kai Lee and he is an accessibility analyst at the National Network for Equitable Library Service. He is also currently studying, studying kinesiology at York University, practices Krav Maga, and is an avid reader. And although it doesn't say it, he also likes chocolate. Uh, Kim Kilpatrick is the coordinator of the CCB's Get Together with Technology program and a professional storyteller. As well as loving all things about Braille, she especially loves guide dogs and dark chocolate. Natalie Martinello holds a PhD in vision science with a specialization in blind and low vision rehabilitation and is the president of Braille Literacy Canada. During her spare time, she loves reading, eating chocolate, drinking espresso, and in normal times, traveling. On behalf of Braille Literacy Canada, the Canadian Council of the Blind, the CNIB Foundation, the Centre for Equitable Library Access, the National Network for Equitable Library Service, and the Provincial Resource Centre for the Visually Impaired, Thank you for celebrating World Braille Day with us. We will, what? Oh, that's the last slide. Sorry about that. Let's get to our panel. <laughs> All right. So uh, our wonderful panelists are going to each have some questions that they're going to um, answer one or more more of um, so we'll get to hear from everybody uh, for this first question and each panelist will have two minutes to um, give their answer and I'll give them about a 15 second warning when their time is up 
Um, and if you have any questions along the way, we'll definitely take questions at the end. So the first question is, what is the earliest Braille gadget or device you remember using? Are there any Braille tech relics from the past you'd love to make, uh, love to see make a triumphant comeback? And uh, let's see, Natalie, let's start with you. All right, so I guess one of the earliest devices I remember was VersaBrailler. So this would have been in the early 90s, um, and I only have vague memories of using it, but it was basically an electronic device that had a braille display and it worked with the use of a, a decoding cassette. And it was the first real refreshable braille display, so it was a breakthrough at the time. Um, I remember it being big, but I really liked uh, pressing down on the keys and knowing that I could write Braille with it. The other earliest device I remember is the Braille and Speak. Um, and this, would, this was a portable note taker um, and it had Braille input keys just like a Perkins Brailler and speech output, but it didn't have a Braille display. So I think it's fun looking back because you really get a sense of how far we've come. Um, while I don't necessarily, um, you know, miss using those earlier tools, um, I do miss maybe the portability of some of those earlier Braille displays like the Braille and Speak. It was very light and portable. Um, and so I think that would be something I would like to advocate for more and more in future devices. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Jen, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I had those devices as well, albeit just a few years earlier than Natalie, because I'm a little bit older. Um, and I thought that that might happen. I figured we'd all maybe mention the Versa Braille. But um, so I, another thing that I thought of that I, I remember I had at one time was it was a keychain, but the keychain part was like a Braille cell where you could push, there were six, I don't know, buttons or whatever that you could move up and down to create, you know, one character. I think it was something that was supposed to help people learn Braille. One of the things that I, this isn't exactly a Braille device, but blind people above a certain age will remember the Opticon. And uh, that basically you would put something on it. There was a camera and you could read like the print on an envelope, for example, but it was raised. You put your finger in this thing and the, these little pins would be in the shape of the letter. So it's not exactly Braille, but it was very cool. The other thing that I love, which I know so you either love this or you hate this, but um, thermoform, which as I do most of my reading on Braille displays now, I don't see a lot of thermoform anymore, but I kind of liked it. Um, thank you. Um, Kim. Well, I guess uh, they've stolen some of mine, but because uh, I also had a Versa Braille, that was the first electronic Braille device I had. Of course, jumping back, the first Braille devices I had were Perkins, which I loved very much, and a Slate, slate Stylus, very um, many Slate Styli styluses. Um, I also had the Braille Light, so that was in the same family as the Braille and Speak. It was like a Braille and Speak, but it had a Braille display on it. And I would say it was one of the most durable displays I ever had. It lasted for years, and it never seemed to break down. So. What I would like to see in terms of triumphant return is a Braille device that is so durable and hardy and protected that we don't have to be sending it back for repairs because any of us who use Braille know that doing that means you're without Braille and often many of us have just one device so you're without Braille for a period of time. So uh, I, I'd like also to bring back the wonder of having that first electronic Braille device like that the uh, Versa Braille it just was amazing to me because I'd never seen anything like it before. So uh, that's what I'd say about that. Great, thank you. Uh, Kai, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so I think for me, uh, the device that I remember very fondly uh, using growing up was the uh, Braille Light Millennium 40. Um, that was my first note taker and um, it, as, as I think a lot of other people described, um, it's very durable uh, and um, it, it wasn't perfect, but there were some really neat features, especially for its time, especially the ability to uh, do a little bit of coding and, uh, you know, playing around with the uh, different voices and the synthesizers and uh, 
or the specific synthesizer that it used. So um, that's uh, that's something that I, I remember very fondly. Um, and in terms of things I would like to see make a comeback, not necessarily specific device or even uh, specific characteristics, but really more of a feature where I remember uh, when you turned on the Braille light, you were immediately dumped into the notepad and it was pretty much instant. You didn't have to worry about boot time or anything like that. Uh, that was really nice. And I think some of these newer displays are trying to emulate that, but it's not exactly the same because there's still a little bit of a delay with some of these um, uh, operating systems that, uh, that they're using because it's a little bit more complex. But um, that's something that I'd like to see a lot more displays have. Thank you. And Debbie, please. Hi. Um, that's the trouble with going last. Most of mine have been spoken, except that um, some of the things, like I agree with Kai on the Braille light, um, as far as instant access to when you turned it on, the instant power, I haven't seen a device that does it quite as well as the Braille light did. And um, I won't answer the other questions about comeback and game changers because I have a feeling they're further on in the list. But um, I do remember like even braille readiness things, sometimes I love the technological side, but I think in the beginning now, not so much perhaps today, but in the beginning, when, when the electronic devices first came out, uh, my first was the Alva 340. And you had to know a fair bit about other stuff in order to use it. Like computers, you had to be comfortable with. So um, that was a barrier for some people. And, you know, I spent a lot of time getting people comfortable with their technology in order to, so that they could use Braille. And that seemed a bit, you know, counterintuitive, but um, learning Braille and at such a young age, I did, you know, even the things like learning to do textures on those touch and tell books. I mean, that you don't think about it now, but um, it was, it really did prepare you for using your hands to, to discern information. Thank you. Everyone's under time. This is wonderful. Um, this next question is for both Natalie and Kim. Um, I think Kim will get you to go first and Natalie second. And the question is, we've seen lots of multi-line displays come onto the scene over recent years. What excites you most about the move towards multi-line devices? And where would you like to these where would you like to see these go next? So I would say that when I saw the first multi-line device and I did test the Canute, the Canute 360, I was just absolutely out of my mind with, with joy about this. Um, because as anyone who's used a Braille display knows, it's only one line of Braille. And the great thing about the multi-line was you could, you could jump to the top of the page, you could skim around, you could you know, you know, review a page, you could look. And especially for things um, uh, like Braille music, poetry, um, scripts that I work with when I'm, I'm preparing storytelling shows, those type of things. It's really amazing to be able to skim around, um, certainly math or uh, graphics, things like that would be great. The one thing I would love to see as the multi-line, so at the moment, the multi-line displays are standalone only. So you just load material on them. They do not connect to a computer, but what I would love to see is them connected to a, a PC or your phone or, or anything so that you could read, say, a calendar in the way that a sighted person could read it, a spreadsheet. You could see the whole spreadsheet. You could go through it, you know, the way a sighted person would. Maps, Google Maps, or things like that, you could do. Um, I really hope the multi-line uh, goes a long way. I'd love to see also a tablet full of braille. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. But I, I'm just so excited about multi-line braille displays. I just love the thought of it. And I want to have one sometime. I just, I just get excited about it. Yeah, so I, I echo everything that Kim has said. Um, braille users have been dreaming about multi-line braille displays forever. And it's exciting to see things like the Canute kind of come into, come onto the market. Um, and, and exciting to see what other organizations are working on as well. Um, it makes a really huge difference because it, it might be difficult for people to understand from the outside because when you're reading Braille, you 
have access to the characters and words that are under your fingers. So why would it matter if you're reading, you know, on a single line display versus a full page? And I think it really comes down to having that spatial information, like Kim mentioned. So, um, you know, one of the things I really love about physical paper braille is knowing where I am in a book. And it just, it's, it feels like an accomplishment knowing that you're about to finish one page and go on to the next page. Um, and then even um, I do a lot of research. And so having access to like a full page of, of data or statistics or math content um, is really important, um, especially because there are so few, um, you know, like there's an underrepresentation of blind people in the STEM field. So um, I think also um, having worked with a lot of adult Braille learners, there's a lot of research that shows that if you have access to a full page of Braille, it really helps with your comprehension because you remember where you saw something, where you read something or felt something in the case of Braille. One of the things I'm most excited about is to see how we can create multi-line braille displays that are more affordable. So using more affordable materials, which is one Seconds. of the reasons why it has been so expensive in the past. And like Kim said, braille on mainstream tablets would be very exciting. Awesome. Um, so this next question is for Jen. Back in the day, a braille document referred to only a paper file, but now we talk about BRFs. Um, there's been lots of advancements here, including the move towards eBRF. For those who aren't aware, can you explain what a BRF is and what will be different with eBRFs? And then what excites you most about where this is heading? Sure, well, um, so for those of you who don't know, a BRF is, BRF is the file name, the file extension, and it's uh, Braille, it stands Braille Ready File. And basically what it is, is a text-based file that, you, you know, if you have a, a, a note taker, braille display, you can read it on that. You can use it. You can open it in like Notepad or Notepad++. Um, and I'm just going to say right now, because I have like two minutes, a really good explanation of what's going on in this situation can get a little bit technical and I'm not going to be able to do that. So this will be kind of high level. But some of the, the major challenges with the BRF file is because it's just text-based, there's no markup, it's not navigable the way that, you know, you can navigate an accessible PDF or Word file using like, you know, H to go through headings and, and things like that. And what happens is a, a transcriber, let's say they use Duxbury to create the Braille file, they put all that markup in there, right? They put H1s, H2s, lists, all those kinds of things. And then when you save to BRF, it's all stripped away and you're back to sort of just this text-based um, ASCII representation. So eBRF is, the, the concept is basically that we would have BRF files that do have this markup that would be navigable, that would be more dynamic. Um, and, and I can't also say a ton about it because it's still in development and it's um, kind of, yeah, it's still, it's still kind of under development and isn't really officially public in, in detail. But basically, the eBRF would work sort of, it's kind of based on XHTML for those of you who have some familiarity with things like EPUB and all that kind of markup language stuff. Um, and so essentially the thing about eBRF is that it will solve the major problems with BRF files. They will become navigable. You'll be able to retain the markup language. So you could have a massive eBRF file and you could search by heading. You could kind of like you could with like, let's say a DAISY file or something along those lines as well. And the, the idea is to make them backward compatible so you can go back and forth between BRF and eBRF if that's what you needed. Again, I apologize because this really needs a lot more time to go into, but basically the thing that excites me about it is that I think eBRF, what it's going to do is make it so that for those who maybe don't choose to access a BRF file, you know, let's say you have the choice between Word and PDF and BRF and, and some people will choose the Word or the PDF simply because it's navigable and searchable. And so what eBRF will do is actually address the drawbacks that we currently find in BRF files. So this might sound a little bit geeky and not actually that exciting, but my sense is that the easier Braille is to create the more access we as Braille readers are going to have. So I think any advancements in um, 
electronic Braille are just to the benefit of Braille readers. I gave you a little extra time there, Jen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop talking now. <laughs> um, all right, this next question is for Debbie and Kai. And uh, Debbie, we'll get you to go first. The question is tactile graphics. One limitation of traditional displays is that they don't provide access to tactile images and graphics. What are some of the exciting tactile graphic devices being talked about right now? And where would you like to see these devices go next? Um, I think one of the biggest is the Canute 360. Um, I go back to the days of the Tiger Embosser and it was one of the first to be able to produce tactile graphics, even though it was done with, with Braille dots. Um, but the advantage of anything that's multi-line, you need multi-line to get real good, understandable tactile graphics. And that's why hard copy tactile is still uh, the way we're going today. Uh, ideally, I can see a device at some point in my lifetime where that may not necessarily have to be the case, but that's for another question on future devices. So I'll get there then. But the Canute is big. Um, there's a lot of things about tactile graphics that make it so good for people who love to read tactile maps. Um, reading Braille tactile is, is really, in a lot of ways, the same in some respects as a print reader reads a map but you need to understand the concepts as well. So like, like in print, there's good map readers and in Braille, there's good tactile readers. Um, I guess the biggest thing I wanna think about here is that tactile reading Braille and graphics is a different skill altogether. Um, you know, you're gonna use your fingers, it's gonna be, you know, the information comes through your fingers, but how you navigate and how you think about the, the, what's on front, underneath your fingers, is different when you're reading a tactile graphic versus reading a page of Braille. Over to you, Kai. Thanks. Yeah, um, I, I loved all those points that you mentioned, especially about um, learning how to read tactile graphics, because a lot of people think, oh, you know, we'll just take this image and then raise all the lines. But that does not work very well because um, there's a lot of clutter and um, you don't really take into account uh, the reader's personal experience that they bring into um, when they when they read tactiles. And so when you want to look at being successful with tactile graphics, um, it's not only about good design, but also about uh, your experiences and uh, whether you have um, some training uh, growing up. And unfortunately, what I, what I see today and just talking to a lot of other people in my community uh, is that uh, we're not afforded those experiences learning how to read tactile graphics, whether that's maps or graphs and that type of stuff. Um, and even when we do get access to tactile graphics, it's only uh, in one direction from the transcriber or from the production facility or from the educator. We don't look at it um, in terms of tactile literacy, which not only includes uh, being able to interpret these graphics, but uh, to be able to draw and to be able to create them as well. Um, and so uh, something that um, will be interesting to see with a lot of these new tactile graphics tablets that are coming out is whether they include functionality to be able to allow you to draw tactile graphics and uh, create diagrams and, and other such things. Um, and right now, um, even though the canoe wasn't designed for uh, tactiles, you can do very simple uh, drawings um, and very simple floor plans with them. Yeah, just one more piece. I think the advent of 3D is going to help a lot in creating good tactile graphics. Um, and I'm looking forward to the day when we have more options available. I think Kai's got a point about learning to draw. And I remember using a, a Sewell raised line drawing kit. Um, back in the early 70s. And it really did, uh, in my electronics classes, I would get people to draw me the circuit diagrams so I was able to see what how the print reader looked at it. And the only thing I couldn't do was label it in Braille. It was, you know, I had almost was there, but not quite. So that that's a big one. That's a, there's a lot of good things about, unfortunately for people who do tactile graphics in Braille, you have to conceptualize um, print, imagery and print information in order to interpret the tap in order to interpret the tactile graphics and 
you know, that's a separate piece altogether that, you know, you, it's a requirement if you're going to be a good tactile graphics reader, I think. Absolutely. Um, this next question is for Natalie. We've also seen lots of Braille learning tools come out onto the market like Braille apps. Um, what are your thoughts, pros and cons on these tools generally? Any advice you'd give to developers working on these applications or advice for users considering these tools? Yeah, so I mean, we talk about it all the time as Braille users, right? Technology increases access to Braille for people who have access to that technology. Um, there are applications that, you know, provide you with different activities to kind of learn Braille on your own. So um, some people do really well with that format, you know, self-paced learning. Um, so provides that option, uh, but not as an alternative to, you know, uh, learning in other ways as well. Uh, the disadvantage is that not everybody learns well on, on their own in that way, right? And the other disadvantage is from like an equity standpoint, not everybody has access to technology, not everyone has, you know, the same level of competency or comfort with technology. And there's this tendency for, um, for really for uh, developers to, um, Natalie, oh. you've muted. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Can you that. start with um, developers have? Yeah, sure. There's a, a tendency for developers to think that um, these tools will replace um, kind of access to professionals who teach Braille. And that's a real problem, right? So I think the two things can evolve at the same time. You can create applications to help with Braille learning, but you also want to advocate for access to trained professionals to teach Braille. For people who want to use these apps, I would say see them as a kind of complementary to other ways of learning and also look at how you can use technology to kind of just reinforce your Braille learning. So you can use Braille screen input to practice kind of the dot configurations for different symbols. You can use a refreshable Braille display on when you're using email or a social media platform, things like that. And for developers, I would just say, view these as complementary to formal learning don't present them as alternatives because you wouldn't be doing that for sighted children, right? You wouldn't be advocating for a device that replaces access to formal instruction. So just be mindful of the misconceptions that you're carrying when you're promoting these tools. Great, thank you. This next question is for Kim. Kim, you're involved with the Getting Together with Technology or GTT group where people can provide advice to each other and help troubleshoot tech issues. From your experience, what advice do you have for people who get frustrated and encounter tech issues when using a new device? Or for users who just don't know where to start with a new Braille device? Well, I think first of all, uh, take it slowly. Don't let your frustration overwhelm you. Um, just learn a little bit at a time. So you don't expect to know how to use your Braille device, every feature of it. You may not ever use every feature of it. Prioritize the features that you wanna use. Do you wanna pair it with your phone or your computer or do you wanna use it on its own as a standalone note taker or a standalone um, device for reading books? Decide what it is you wanna do first. Prioritize those tasks and work at those tasks um, get help from the people who already have the device and know how to use it. So, so find some support within the community, which is easier to do these days with, with all of us around, around you here. Um, pick your device carefully too, if possible. Uh, we can't afford to have so, so many devices. So before getting a device, maybe ask people who have them, what are the pros and cons of those specific devices? And so pick them carefully and then learn them slowly. And if you're frustrated, just put it down and go do something you love and then come back to it. So that, that's sort of rule of thumb for uh, all things like learning, um, I would say. And, and just know that it's going to help you and, and, and be good, but you, you can't hit the ground running. You have to gradually uh, take, it, take it one step at a time and learn it. Um, and know your learning style and the 
limitations and, and skills. So some of us, I rip open a box, I pull the display out, I start playing with it. I, that's what I do. I know people who do not do that. They read the whole manual first. You know, they don't feel comfortable just opening a box seconds. and pulling something out. So know that, know your style and, uh, and have fun. And know that just, just have fun and keep an open mind. That's what I would say. Excellent, thank you. Uh, this next question is for Kai. Kai, as a student, how do you think Braille technology helps you most? And what about with STEM um, subjects? Yeah, so um, I guess before I really dive into that, I, I do want to say that in order to be successful uh, in whatever you want to do in life, um, it's important to look at Braille as one of the tools. It's not the only tool, um, of course. Uh, like many of uh, my other panelists, I use uh, speech as well. Uh, and so part of the process um, for me as a, uh, as a student and, uh, and figuring out how uh, to use the tools that I do um, is to figure out their strengths, weaknesses, and, uh, and then figure out um, the, the best way to apply it for me. And so when it comes to Braille, uh, for me, I find that uh, reading more technical material with a lot of uh, medical terms um, that uh, that's easier to process uh, in Braille. Um, but for um, general communication and looking at uh, uh, documents and, and stuff like that, uh, I might look at look at it with uh, speech and and then if I'm writing something, I might review it in Braille and figure out um, make sure that you know, I don't have any spelling mistakes and uh, formatting errors, that type of stuff. Um, but especially in STEM, um, the a big piece in kinesiology is, is uh, looking at anatomy and uh, dealing with tons and tons of diagrams. Um, and so uh, being able to have some skill in reading tactile graphics is essential uh, and um, being able to uh, communicate in that way, whether uh, you're talking about a diagram or a graph, um, being able to communicate with someone using those images uh, is, I think, another really important skill to have. Um, Seconds. So I, I guess to conclude, um, Braille is definitely essential, I, I find, uh, in how I study. Um, and I, I think I would not do as well as I do academically without Braille. Uh, this next question is for everyone, um, and it is, we also see a lot of gadgets that never take hold. Why do you think that is? And if you could say anything to developers, what would you say? Uh, Debbie, since you went last before, let's start with you. Debbie, you're on mute. That's what happens when you play around with it. Um, I think one of the things about it, about gadgets in general that don't take off is that there, in order to make a good gadget, it needs to have people at the table that, that understand its intent, that understand what do you need to do and what do you use? So uh, bringing in people that are users of the technology is useful. Uh, you know, sometimes it could be as simple as just the layout of the gadget itself. Just if things are, are not placed in a good location for, for hands, you know, if, uh, things like this. So I think one of the problems with, with gadgets, and, and in the beginning, every, many people have great ideas about this would really work well uh, for blind people or low vision individuals. And in, in some cases it does, but it may already be invented. Um, the other piece to it is that gadgets by their nature, um, you know, it's kind of goes back to what Kim mentioned about GTT. Understand the purpose. What's it for? What are you going to do with it? Um, sometimes people just get a great idea and said, let's make this, but then where does it go from there? So um, these are things that happen when you have gadgets. And it's quite understandable that, that there are things that don't take off a lot of them and they go in phases. Uh, you know, some for a while it was orientation and mobility aids that were that was new ones coming out all the time. And um, in the Braille world, for the most part, in Braille, um, you know, they've been they've been pretty good. Uh, 15 seconds. There's been a 
there's been a few, but other than that, it's, it's been pretty good. So uh, I think that's about it for me. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Um, Kai. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely several factors that play uh, into this. Um, but one of the big ones that I see is just um, they, as, as Debbie said, they have really good, um, uh, well, they have a lot of interest and really want to help. But uh, sometimes those ideas uh, might not uh, work out well because uh, maybe it's something that we're already able to do and some using some alternative techniques and strategies uh, or uh, maybe uh, the way it works is very cumbersome, it's too expensive. Uh, and so um, unfortunately, some of these developers, uh, they don't take these factors into consideration. Um, but I, I think the other uh, aspect of it that I've seen too is that um, they, uh, they might have a really great idea and the prototype works out really well, but they're just not able to get the funding. Um, and they kind of underestimate how much money it takes to bring some of these products to market. So, um, yeah, it, it's definitely a challenge, uh, but, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, just Braille devices, I think for the most part, haven't seen anything, uh, particularly outrageous. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before we go on, I just want to like say so that Debbie and Kai aren't beating around the bush here. I think you guys were alluding to um, developers not consulting the blind and low vision community. Would that yes. be correct? Correct. <laughs> um, Kim, would you like to go next? Well, I agree with what Kai and, and Debbie said. I think consulting the community is vital and, and it has to be done all along the way. And also doing research even before consulting the community, is there something already out there that you could, you could find? Um, I think in terms of braille devices, I've seen some a bit horrible ones that one of the things beyond um, the design, like Debbie said, where your hands are placed, where the braille is, where the panning buttons are, or, uh, buttons to move the braille forward, have to be located where braille readers, where it makes sense for braille readers to to use them. But one thing I saw once was a device that wasn't protected from the elements. And, and so I said, well, what about, and it was a, it was a watch. What about if I went outside with it? What about if I banged my hand on the wall when I was using a cane or a guide dog? What about if, you know, I'm using it in the elements, I'm not driving a car, I'm outside, you know, I'm, what about if, um, you know, I'm needing to use it on a bus, like, is it going to be dust resistant, you know, so also think about the lifestyles of the people and where they would use it and how, and I really agree with uh, Debbie too, is where are you, uh, what's it for, like, what is the use for, and is this use that's necessary, um, I think I would also tell them, um, know that we're a small market, so I'm, it's too bad that we are, but we are a small market. So maybe try to get big companies on board like Apple, Microsoft, Google, you know, that have money, Amazon, you know, to help you develop seconds. this or put it in their product as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Jen. So um, I agree with what everyone else has said so far, and mine is a little bit connected, but I'm, I'm calling it the Jada dot issue. And I don't know if any of you have heard of the Jada dot or ever have seen one or used one, but I, I think maybe I saw one once, but I never owned one, but I thought it was this really cool device. Cause it was like a very small, um, sort of like a really, really portable Perkins brailler in the sense that you could use six keys to create your braille. And then it would the paper could would come rolling out. You could only use small paper. Like it was, I think you could even hang it around your neck. They said um, it came with a strap. And so the reason I'm using this as an example is that I actually thought this was a really cool idea. It's portable. You could produce Braille and you could use the Perkins Brailler style if you weren't as comfortable with the Slayton stylus and you could read the Braille as you did it. But it had this one overarching flaw in my mind and that is that it would cost like $500. And so, um, I guess that's sort of where I'm going is that there's these great gadgets that have been devised or developed, but then they have this one overarching flaw and it might be the cost. It might be something like, you know, what Kim was mentioning with the braille not being, you know, being totally exposed to the elements. 
And so I think that is the reason why a lot of the gadgets haven't survived is that they're great, but they have this one problem about them that overrides all of the benefits that they have. And so I think that's what I would say to developers is to sort of think big picture and, and don't just think about, oh, this is such a great device. Look what it does. Think about, is it practical? Is it affordable? Is it like, and think about all these big picture items. So I, I just, I don't know. I just thought that is sort of, for me, the Jada dot kind of represents this whole idea of like these great gadgets that just, you know, they're on the market for a bit and then they just kind of go away. So that's what I have to say. Oh, thank you. Uh, Natalie. Yes, so I agree with everything that everyone has said so far. Um, you know, like developers are people and people have misconceptions sometimes about things. And the problem is that when you have those misconceptions, then you're basing your questions about what you're developing on solutions for problems that don't necessarily exist. So you see this a lot in mobility. Other people talked about this, like wearable devices that will vibrate anytime you're about to encounter an obstacle, which is not very practical because it would be vibrating all the time. Um, in the in the area of Braille, I, you know, it's not necessarily technology, but I I've, I've had a lot of people approach me about you know. Uh, developing alternative codes to Braille. And that's based on the idea that Braille is too difficult and Braille users don't want an alternative to Braille. We had raised line tactile um, systems before Braille and it didn't work. And that's why Louis Braille developed his code. And so it just goes back to including people who are blind with visual impairments uh, from the start. And that doesn't just mean in user testing, by the way, that also means recognizing that there are a lot of blind people who are developers and researchers and experts too. So including them on your team, not making assumptions about what we need or reinventing the wheel. And also thinking about, like Jen said, the practicality of what happens once that device is um, available. How do you get uh, support when it stops working? Um, so working with other developers, I think on more mainstream options is really important, but also uh, not just including us as experts from the start, but please compensate people with uh, all seconds. disabilities for the expertise that they provide, that we provide. Please recognize that and, and compensate them for, for what they're doing. Well, thank you. All right. So our uh, next question is for everybody. So you have a crystal ball. You can invent any Braille technology you want. The sky is the limit. What would you love to have your hands on in the future? And where do you think there are still gaps? Uh, Jen, we'll start with you. You're on okay, am I unmuted now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so. Yeah, I would, we've talked about some of the things already people have mentioned, like tactile iPad screens and, and Braille tablets and things like that. I also think one of the challenges we have is that we have sort of one extreme or the other, right? We have, you can go all out and spend top prices on something with a whole pile of features, or you can get something that's fairly inexpensive, but it doesn't have a lot of features. So I would like to see something in between. Um, I would also like, you know, where there's, features but it's not the most expensive device on the market i would like um i mean we talk about consulting the community which obviously is really important but it's just in in my crystal ball and my device you know what i would want as a device i just want to remind people that you know what jen golden wants isn't necessarily what kim kilpatrick or natalie martinello wants like we we do have you know we're not all one and the same even though we do agree on lots of things but one thing that I would love if I could invent anything I want is a braille display where the dots never fade and where I can like take it in the bathtub if I want to. I can sit on the beach if I want to. <laughs> braille displays right now are so fragile because you can't get anything into the holes where the pins come up. And that's one of the biggest challenges, at least for me. I'm forever, you know, I can't wear hand cream ever. I can't, you know, I know that sounds dumb, but in the winter when your hands are dry, right? Because I'm always reading a display. So I would like a display where nothing could get into the holes and you could bake your cookies with your recipe on your Braille display on your kitchen table and not worry about 
you know, keeping it spick and span 100% clean. So there's my shallow braille request. Thank you. Uh, Kai. Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, because I just love uh, tactile graphics and uh, just designing, drawing, creating stuff, um, I'd love to see a tactile display that can do more than just um, line drawings and shading and uh, that type of stuff, but really can go um, 3D where you can, you know, sculpt things and then have it reflected uh, on the screen and in a CAD file and then be able to um, create your braille labels for them uh, or audio labels and be able to use your fingers to physically move those labels to the different parts of your model. I think that'd be so cool. And uh, I, I don't think it's impossible to do, but it would definitely be a long way off before we see something like that. Thank you. Um, Debbie. Um, I'm going to carry on with some of Kai's and some of Jen's pieces. Um, my device is, it's, it's, it, you can either do it as a software solution or a hardware solution. Uh, my software solution is about the size of an eight and a half by 11 flexible sheet of paper. Um, and you could hold it, uh, supposing that you are in a situation where there's print in front of you and you want to know what it is. You could be, you know, in a doctor's office, you could be standing at a streetcar stop or somewhere and you want to know what it says. And you would hold this flexible thing in front of you and it would use haptics or um, virtual reality or augmented reality so that what came in print on that sign or whatever you were looking at you can feel that in braille under your fingers. So you can read instantly by holding up this device to what is in front of you in a print text or even a tactile graphic in Kai's example. And then I like Kai's idea about moving the pieces around um, and creating the labels because then you could, someone be showing you something and um, it could be a device that you just bought and you just wanna have a look at it and label it like you do in a print manual. So you could make your own labels right there um, or you could import them. They might even be already created. You could take it from the print manual, which is online and create the, create the labels and place them where they go on the, on the 3D diagram that you've just created by holding up this device. Um, the other way to do it, it could be to have a, a separate braille tablet, but again, that's gonna be a lot. Well, both of them aren't cheap. Um, but either way, when you're, when you're finished with it, you just fold up your flexible sheet of paper, put it back in your pocket, and then you're, uh, you're off to the next adventure. Great. Kim. Wow, I'm just picturing this piece of paper eight and a half by 11. Um, I agree with Jen, durable, durable in any, any location and any under any conditions. I would love to see a device that's created by mainstream companies and so available in mainstream stores and also available to um, repair in mainstream stores. Uh, I would say a multi-line display, maybe like a tablet that you could connect to whatever device with a camera that you could you know, take pictures of text to scan it. Um, all included in, in a nice package that isn't that expensive, but I think available um, easily so that you could, you could return it, replace it, get it fixed and have it back you know, soon after. I would love to see that. Um, I, I would love to see them all over the place, just available you know, in public places or wherever they hand it to you to read a menu or to do something like all over the place in museums, that it's like a braille tablet instead of just a, just an audio thing. I would love that, that they become so ubiquitous that the, the price of them comes down. Um, that would be to add to what Kai, I mean, I loved what Kai and Debbie said about graphics and, and, and haptic braille and all this, which is a really cool idea too. Um, I just, just uh, yeah, guys, the limit really. Thank you. And Natalie. 
Yeah, I mean, all of these ideas sound super exciting. Um, I agree with what everyone has already said. My my ideas are actually really similar to what Debbie mentioned. I just think about portability and instant access to Braille. So I want a Braille display you can fold up and put in your pocket. I want a device that you can literally just put a piece of paper um, on it or scan in front of um, you know any kind of printed text and it'll instantly provide that information in Braille. I mean, we already have really good apps like seeing AI that do that kind of OCR. So, you know, some kind of portable all-in-one Braille device that could do that would be really, really helpful and, and good to have. Um, the other thing is what Kim mentioned. Um, I'd love to see Braille access become mainstream in the same way that text-to-speech is. So something like voiceover that's already on all Apple devices. I'd love to see um, mainstream devices that incorporated Braille somehow that just like magically popped up onto the screen if you wanted it. And that way anyone who has access to that tablet can, can use Braille. So maybe thinking about like, how do you provide greater mainstream access to Braille on products as well. Uh, sorry, Leanne, if I just have one more piece, but Natalie maybe think of it. Uh, you want to be able to share these explorations as well. So supposing Natalie looked at something or Kai looked at something, um, and we wanted to share it and save it in an archive that everybody else could have access to that stuff. So as people, as, as people use these devices, uh, they could just be stored as images um, or as text and, you know, don't worry about finding it. It's already been, it's here. That There would be a tremendous wealth of information and archive for people to access as, as these things kept going. And when you see the advancements about the iPhone and what it can do to describe images, and you can even explore images now, I think we're closer than we think, but we're not quite there. Mm -hmm. Check I in see. again with us in five years. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this next question is for everybody as well. How would you describe the role Braille technology plays in your life as a Braille user? How do you decide when to use a device and when you prefer hard copy Braille? Uh, let's start with Natalie. Yeah, I mean, um, again, we, we've talked about this today that just technology provides more access to Braille. If you have access to that technology, it's still, you know, really expensive for some people. Not everyone's able to afford it. Uh, but I use Braille every day because I am fortunate enough to have access to several Braille displays. Um, so now I can get a book on the day it's released and read it like everyone else, assuming that book, that ebook is in an accessible format. So that's a huge game changer. Um, at the same time, you know, I still prefer hard copy Braille for a bunch of other tasks that I need to do, like giving presentations. I will emboss my presentation notes in hard copy Braille so that I can kind of have easier access to a full page. I still need paper Braille when I want to read graphs or figures. But I think it's like what yeah. Debbie mentioned. I think we're headed in the right direction. All of these things, we're, we're starting to see these things evolve. And so I think as long as we keep kind of pushing for more affordable solutions as we're developing these multi-line devices, um, that technology will continue to bring Braille to more and more people. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Kim. So thank, thank you, Rayan. Um, I think um, I went for quite a long time. Well, I started off life as always having Braille. Let's go for the blind. And then I went for quite a long time where I was not, I didn't have Braille at all. I only had audio and I just had Braille when I made notes on the Perkins or the Slate. When I got to the place where and I had Braille again, I had a Braille display again, I really swore I would never be without one because my Braille consumption went up hundreds and hundreds of percent. And I use Braille every day, all the time. I use it to host Zoom calls. I use it to um, create my scripts for storytelling. I use it to, um, in meetings, I use it to take notes. I use it all the time. I just, there's, I have a Braille display connected to my phone right now. 
for this call. I, I just use it all the time. I don't have the luxury of an embosser, so I don't use hard copy Braille. I think I would, if I had an embosser, I would do what Natalie kind of said is print out agendas or print out presentation notes in case my Braille display went faulty or my, the, the phone unpaired with the display, which has, you know, has happened. So I, I, I would love to see the financial ability for me to have everything, like to have an embosser plus a Braille display, you know, plus um, or have easy access to an embosser, you know, and when I need it, uh, maybe in, through a library or other, other places as well, uh, if I need that. But if I had a choice, when I have a choice, which, you know, um, under some funding, I, I could have either or, I would always get a Braille display um, just because that's more practically useful for me. Well, thank you. Um, Jen. Well, when you ask uh, what Braille technology means in my life or what Braille means in my life, the word oxygen comes to mind. I have always been an avid reader and I'm not auditory. So um, speech isn't really a good alternative for me. I do sometimes use it when, when I have to, but um, I'm, and I guess I, and this is not a comment on the validity of this question. It's a great question, but um, I just want to say like, for those of you among the participants who are cited, imagine if somebody asked you what print means to you and then you'll have kind of an idea of what Braille means to me. And I think what Braille means to everybody on this panel based on what everyone has said. Um, like Natalie, I am fortunate enough to have access to more than one display and I use, you know, when I'm working and I use displays a lot because I like to always, I never wanna be out somewhere and have a few minutes to spare and not be able to read a book. So with Braille displays and my iPhone or whatever I have, I, I, I always have access to lots of reading material. Um, I would say 95% of the time I am using a display just because that's the easiest way to have access. But um, I do like hard copy for certain tasks and Natalie mentioned some of them. So it kind of depends on the document type and on the purpose that I'm, you know, why I'm reading the document. Another thing too, is if I'm going somewhere where I'm concerned that um, a braille display might get damaged. Uh, going back to my beach example, um, that's not the only thing, but you know, there are times where I just feel like it's probably a better idea to have hard copy braille. Um, but it's really difficult because I think there's a lot of, you know, we can go on all day about what braille, how we use it, but ultimately braille for me is a means to an end. It's a way that I access information independently. Thank you. Debbie. Um, I'm I'm probably about 80-20 uh, electronic Braille versus 20% hard copy. And my 80% is, it, it's pretty well subdivided as basically if I, I need to learn something. Um, basically, so what happens is if I have to make a presentation or I'm actively engaging with the audience, then I really would prefer um, braille under my fingers um, in, in, in a hard copy if I'm giving a presentation because you can skim the page. You can shuffle the cards. You can shuffle the deck. Doing it on a braille display, you know, it might take a second or two to get to your next slide or to, you know, it, it's, the, it's the mechanics of using a braille display for a presentation that, that aren't quite as e efficient as my skimming the page are. Having said that, full disclosure, I'm a real format hound. So I really rely on format of a hard copy sheet or braille to let me know information just as a print reader does. Um, they skim the page and say, okay, this is important, but this is not, this is bolded, this is not. So I use a lot of the overview techniques that a print reader uses with hard copy. When I'm using a braille display, the, one of the biggest things about it is reading current events, reading current news. I wanna know how people's names are spelled. Um, how sports teams players are spelled, uh, you know, things, because it's not always what you think. And, um, you know, you might hear something on the radio and you know how it's pronounced, you can say it perfectly, but you have no idea how it's written. So that's where using Braille for current events and for reading stuff on the internet, that's, that's where it really is useful. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And Kai. 
Yeah, so um, I, I want to say first that I'm very fortunate to be able to have multiple uh, Braille devices. I have a Braille display, um, I have uh, the Canute, I have a Braille embosser. And so, you know, you might wonder what the heck are you going to use all these devices for? But um, I, I find personally that there are situations where I do want hard copy. And um, as others have said, um, giving presentations, speeches, uh, sure, you know, you can read um, your speech on a Braille display, but then, you know, you're having to constantly uh, click the next button and it sometimes feels like an endless scroll. Uh, but with Braille, you know, you've gotten to the bottom of the page. You can uh, find paragraphs uh, really easily. You don't have to um, worry about uh, your technology breaking down. Um, so things like that uh, make giving presentations um, really useful. And of course, um, the embossed I have is the, uh, the View Plus uh, Columbia, which can do tactile graphics. Um, and one of its biggest features, of course, as a Tiger embosser is that it does multi-dot height. And that's, uh, yeah. that to me is especially useful um, for more complex diagrams and uh, stuff like that, where um, if you have all different types of lines overlapping on top of each other at the same height, it's very hard to follow. But when you have it uh, using different dot heights um, or even just different types of lines, it makes it a lot more easy to uh, interpret and understand. Um, and in terms of uh, the Canute, um, I, I find that I use it a lot uh, to read novels um, because it's just seconds. really easy to um, load a book on there and get uh, a good spatial representation. And, uh, you know, I, I won't use it for work because it's too loud. So that's kind of one of its downsides. So uh, in that sense, um, I've kind of figured out uh, what works best for me in terms of all these tools. Well, thank you. And we have one last question before we move uh, on to open questions and answers from, from all, all that attended today. Um, so this, this question is for everybody. Having a stable device that meets users' needs is one thing, but there are lots of other factors that could impact your success with different technologies. What makes a good tactile image? What about any other skills you need to read a tactile graphic effectively? Any tips for Braille users who struggle with reading tactile images? Um, I will start with you. Sure. Uh, so um, in, in terms of strategies for uh, reading, I think um, starting with something really simple, uh, learning to follow lines and looking at shapes and understanding how using different shapes can create different objects, uh, you know, and, and animals and, and that type of things, uh, you know, can really help um, start develop to, to develop some of those uh, concepts. Um, and then as you progress, uh, then you can start working on more complex graphics. Uh, and uh, look at um, how, how to kind of read uh, the different types of graphics. So for example, uh, the way I read a graph would be very different than uh, looking at a cartoon, for example. Uh, and you know, one of those strategies is understanding, okay, you know, with a graph you have uh, x-axis, y-axis, you have labels. So um, you know, taking it systematically, looking at the labels and understanding, okay, because of uh, the way this is configured, then this is what it means when this line goes up and this one goes down. Uh, and then, um, of course, with cartoons, you want to um, look at uh, labels, but um, there might be uh, different textures that you have to deal with. And then um, figuring out how to do that uh, systematically as well, exploring the image systematically uh, and looking at the legend if there is one. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd just say to um, start with something simple, work, work up to it and uh, have fun with it because uh, there, there's this misperception that people think that it's uh, all these tactile graphics are only for education, but they could really be used for um, leisure, whether you're looking at cartoons or, uh, you know, just COVID data, which uh, of course is um, really helpful these days to understand. Um, what's going on. Uh, and so, yeah, um, just, I think uh, tactile graphics are a wonderful thing. And uh, I hope you take a chance and, uh, and give it a try. 
Excellent, thank you. Natalie. Yeah, I think I echo everything that was said. That was all really good advice. I think um, if you're new to tactile graphics, just start with simpler graphics. Um, I always like to look at the legend first, if there is one, because that kind of helps you make sense of what different symbols mean or what you'll find in that graphic. I also kind of think of it a lot like when you're exploring a new like physical environment, you know, you want to get a global picture of what's uh, in the room or in this case on the page. So using kind of like just those strategies to explore the full page. Um, and then looking at, you know, different details in that image can really help. Um, but also just remember, you know, it also depends on the quality of the tactile graphic. If there's too much detail, like we talked about before, it might make it more difficult. And so that comes back to just, you know, ensuring that we have uh, good access to tactile graphics. And also recognizing that everybody comes with different experiences, right? If you were born without any vision, um, there might, for some people, not everyone, but there might be certain concepts uh, that you might not be as familiar with what certain things look like. Whereas if you've had some vision um, before, that might not be the case. It really depends on the person. Um, and so just kind of do what works best for you and, and you'll develop those strategies that, um, that will be the best for you. Excellent, thank you. Jen. Um, yeah, I guess I would say as with all kinds of learning, practice is really important and practice, especially um, on subjects that interest you. I've always loved astronomy. And so a, a few years ago, I purchased a book called Touch the Stars produced by National Braille Press. And it's fascinating. Plus, it gives me a chance to have access to tactile graphics. And so I would just say if there's a topic that interests you where tactile graphics kind of fits in, that's maybe a way that you can can get into it. I would also say for those who are producing tactile graphics, um, kind of putting on my banner hat here, the um, guidelines and standards for tactile graphics is actually was initiated in Canada many years ago. Um, and then it's now a joint BANA and, um, well, it's now taken on by Braille Authority of North America and an update is under review and it's coming out. And the reason I mention that is just that there's all kinds of ways to make tactile graphics, but um, I think somebody mentioned, you know, consistency and if things are too busy or they're, you know, the there there is no differentiation between different things. These guidelines give a lot of detail on how to produce not just how to produce them, but how to make sure they're effective so that, you know, they can be accessed by someone who's not looking at them by, so they can be accessed tactually and so that things can be communicated the way they need to be communicated when you're accessing something um, from a tac tactile perspective. So I think I'm kind of, I know that's more advice to those of you who may be educators or producing tactile graphics, but it is really important to to look at guidelines and to be consistent and and um, again for those of you who are braille readers just and i'm not trying to pun but get your hands on tactile graphics if you possibly can because like kai said they're not just for learning they, they can be a lot of fun not that learning's not fun <laughs> learning is fun but they can be for <laughs> extracurricular things thank you debbie um, thanks, uh, Leanne. Um, one of the things about tactile graphics is, as Kai mentioned, and, and Jen, keep it simple. Um, learn um, the basics. Learn about tracking the lines. Um, assume that every, uh, try, learn to discern different textures under your fingers. Uh, chances are good that every single texture means something. When I look at a tactile graphic for the first time, I'll start at the top of the graphic generally and work my way down without looking at anything else first. And then I will put the symbols together in my head. So when I find something that looks quote unquote important, maybe the texture stands out or maybe the height is different, I'll go look at the legend or the key at that time. Um, build, you need to, as, as a blind person, as a blind person exploring a tactile graphic, there's a lot of putting the pieces together piece by piece in a systematic manner. 
when a sighted person looks at a tactile graphic, they can see the entire overview piece. So they don't need to put it together. They may need to take it from the other side and take it apart. We need to build it um, from the beginning and then we have the entire concept. What makes a good image? Um, as Jen mentioned, the guidelines are crucial, the tactile graphics guidelines that the Braille Authority of North America is currently working on. And I had the pleasure to review and I thoroughly enjoyed the process. Thank you uh, to those who assisted with that. Um, the, the piece to do this is understanding the key. Um, start with something that you know. If you've never looked at a tactile before, but you have you know, touched things in your environment, you Just know what second. that feels like. Look at it on the tactile graphic and sort of discern the information that you're getting. Um, I think that's it. And pay attention to texture changes. That, that's a big one. Thank you. I just want to jump in. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, real quick before I forget my thought. Um, yeah, personal experiences are uh, really important, especially if um, you're looking at a map. Uh, start with, you know, your own home and your own neighborhood. It's something that you'll probably know very well. Uh, and so um, using that as a starting point will be uh, really helpful for that. Thanks. Thank you. Kim? I'm a little embarrassed to say that I'm terrible with uh, tactile graphics. Um, I think partly because I was born blind and partly because I didn't really have access to them for a long time. So um, speaking, I have to have a real crash course. I have to get Kai or someone to help me learn them. Um, but I think speaking from that perspective, I sort of have had a mental block about them. I'll skip them because I feel like, oh, I just get it from the words. I don't care about that. That's like, that's like uh, pictures for sighted people. No, 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 no. So I guess what this has taught me today is to, to be open-minded. So I would say for others, um, especially people who have had the same experience as me, uh, to be open-minded and try to explore them. And for educators, um, try to look them out for people and encourage that braille learning. So I had really good instruction in learning braille, uh, how to read and write braille in, in all different ways, but not as much about these type of things. So um, remember that that's another field of, um, of information that is really beneficial for your students to have or your um, kids, blind kids or, or people to have. So um, I'm, I'm just embarrassed to say that I'm terrible with them and uh, I'll try to improve that that can be my uh, New Year's resolution is to learn more about them and, and to improve with that. I'll lend you, you my Touch the Stars book. It's really fun. It's a great book. Thank you, everyone. Um, so before we kind of move on, I do have one question um, regarding tactile graphics. Uh, what would you say the importance of pairing it with um, a really good image description if it's not um, in the text would be? Depending on context, of course, um, whoever would like to answer that one. I would say it depends on, it depends on the, the, the graphic, it depends on the context. Um, I think that that can be really helpful because a tactile graphic is wonderful, but if the person isn't able to put it to something, then it it may not be very useful. But I think it's a little bit, you know, if you're looking, let's say you're talking about a map, right? You're going to have a legend. You're going to have, and I really liked what Debbie said, giving specific instructions about their directions on how to access the, the tactile graphic. Like I will look at the whole thing. I'll just kind of do an overall, what am I looking at? Then I look at the legend and then I go back and do what Debbie talked about. So I'm not sure if I really answered your question actually, but. I'll try, uh, Rianne. It's, um, if, if the image description can be done in a concise manner, because no matter what you do, if you're in the middle of a text, you're going to interrupt the text to decipher the tactile. It's just, you know, there's not another way around it. Um, so it's kind of like, I guess, the equivalent out of an aside in a play. So um, if, if the tactile graphic, if you can do it as an image description, and it's really done, it's determined probably by the best way to, to think about it from a production standpoint, 
Um, if the text in the if the text you're reading describes it well enough, you may not need either. Um, that next point, if it's if it's an image description that you can do concisely, that might that might do it for you. But if it's going to be something, and it depends on the subject matter, to be honest, I think you know there are certain subject matters that just require tactile. So yeah. I'm, That's I'm not where sure I was that going. answers. Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not <laughs> sure that answers your question when I think about it. But but there are some subject matters that just do, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and, and have a little image description, perhaps. But if it's a good tactile, then you should be OK. But if you don't think that it's better to have an, a, a good description and no tactile than it is to have a bad tactile, right? Because you know, you're yeah. only going to frustrate the person, and they have to stop and decipher it anyway. Absolutely. So it's not always a one or the other situation. Sometimes it's a both working complementary to provide context or perception or you know, the fact that an emoji doesn't have a nose <laughs> right. or ears. And, you know, yeah. Right. And, and, I, and I'd love to have a, a book of emojis in tactile. I've never seen them, you know. I mean, I know what they say they are, uh, mm -hmm. but I've never seen, I've never felt one, you know. I mean, because I, I, it wasn't something that was done in my tactile. Maybe Kai has seen them, but I, I haven't. Like, I'd like to see what they look like. Do they look like how they're described? Uh, yeah, uh, and in, I... In, I I would say also, in addition to, to what you're talking about, Debbie and others, um, in addition to the guidelines, there's some really cool, exciting work being done in the US um, with National Bill Press and Lighthouse San Francisco and others, this consortium of tactile graphics where they're actually working on uh, research around best practices and how to teach tactile graphics and other things around that. But I agree, I think um, it depends on the graphic, but it, it's, it's, it's probably better to have some kind of description, but not necessarily a detailed description of everything if it's a good tactile graphic, so it depends. Yeah, so um, the way I look at this is um, the image description, it, it really depends, as everyone has said, uh, on the image. Um, I can, if it's a well-designed graphic, uh, and depending on the subject matter, uh, like a graph or uh, even uh, certain types of diagrams, I wouldn't need a description. But um, for things that are very complicated, like cartoon strips or um, you know, comic strips, that, that type of stuff. Uh, I think it's nice to have some sort of description. Yeah. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, a replacement for the image, uh, but instead acts to set the context and to give a very brief overview of what's there. And, and I think in that way, uh, it prepares you for what you're expecting to look at. So if the description has, um, I don't know, uh, a, a taxi with a person getting into a car with a dog, uh, you know, if you know what those things look like in two dimensions, then uh, it, it kind of speeds up your reading of the image, your interpretation of the image. Uh, so then you can focus on all the details about that. Uh, and so I think the way that we should look at image descriptions uh, should actually be a, a supplement to a tactile graphic, not necessarily as um, a, a full description that you would expect that's supposed to uh, replace the uh, the actual visual image as well. And so um, in, in terms of how that's designed, I, I think that's kind of up in the air because we just don't know enough about that just yet. Can I yeah, also image... just say, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, um, one sentence, the, the image description, like if it's, if it's trying to, if it's a cartoon strip and it's implying emotion such as humor, I think that's helpful to know because looking at the graphic, you might not get that as a blind person, but it's, that it's a humorous uh, comic strip, right? So the image could, the described description should perhaps, you know, subtly indicate the humor in it. But like, so think of it, of the description as a supplement to the tactile. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, I, I just like to say, um, <laughs> I guess <laughs> in my defense, because I, I'm, I'm not good with the, the pictures and the tactile, and I'm a real language word learner. Um, and so, for example, when I plan a route somewhere, I write out in words, walk three blocks, turn right, it's two doors down, there's three steps up to the door, the door pulls towards you, you know. Um, so I guess we just also want to be aware, and I'm sure I could improve my tactile graphic uh, literacy, 
But I think we also need to be aware that as with sighted learners, blind learners fall into different categories. Or so some are, I want, I want to call them visual learners, but that's not the term I'm looking for. But I am a language right one, word learner, right? Yeah. So I'm not a visual blind learner. Um, if you know what I mean, like pictures are not as meaningful to me as words. Um, so I guess we just want to keep that in mind that that some people just don't learn that way as easily as others do. So to provide an alternative uh, for them, for those of us who prefer that a bit, um, is a good thing too, because the way people absorb information is, is different as it is in, in the sighted world as well. So I just want to- And remember that. if the text covers it off, you might not need the description, right? You got to go by the surrounding text. So- I think this is where the judgment of the transcriber comes in because there's, you know, there's often discussion about here's, here's the rule, follow it. But there are times where you, you have to take the rules and the guidelines and what you know about the subject that you're transcribing and what you know about transcription and make the best decision you can. And some transcribers, sometimes when they're transcribing, they know the student as well. They know who's going to, that's not always the case, but sometimes they do and they can factor that in as well. So I think there's always that piece of it is the judgment of the transcriber. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So... We are going to continue on here. So on behalf of Braille Literacy Canada, the Canadian Council of the Blind, the CNIB Foundation, the Centre for Equitable Library Access, the National Network for Equitable Library Service, and the Provincial Resource Centre for the Visually Impaired, thank you for celebrating World Braille Day with us. And thank you so much to our panelists and for everything that you've shared today. Uh, we are now going to stop the recording and allow for a short question and answer period. <laughs>